Wow. Uh, what is the abundant life? I don't know if the other speakers define what the abundant life is. There may be some of you probably wondering what is the abundant life. They're telling me I need to change in order to experience the abundant life. They're telling me that I need to pray, that I need to be fruitful and pursue and promote peace in order to experience the abundant life. But what is the abundant life? Let me give you a definition. And like I said, I don't know if they defined it or not. If they did, fine. If not, that's fine. I just hope that uh, what I'm about to say complements what has already been said. The abundant life is the kind of life where you get to enjoy every spiritual blessing that is found in Christ Jesus because he is the only one who can offer you that life. So that's the abundant life, the kind of life where you get to enjoy every spiritual blessing that is found in Christ Jesus because he is the only one who can offer you that life. That's the abundant life. Ephesians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10, the latter part uh, of verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it, the King James or New King James says, more abundantly. So there is abundantly and there is more abundantly when you are in Christ. And think about it. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? In other words, you can have anything you want in life. You can have money, you can have fame, you can have power, but if you don't have the abundant life that Jesus offers you, then you have nothing. You have zero. You don't even have a future. Well, technically you do, uh, it's not going to be a bright future, though. It's going to be a bleak future. But I want you to understand that the kind of life that Jesus offers is important. And you should make sure you attain it by obedience through the gospel. The invitation was offered earlier. So it's a wise decision to obey the gospel because that's how you access uh, the abundant life. But let me ask you another question to elaborate just a little bit further. I know we're a little bit pressed with time, and I'm not going to cover all of it. But... What does the abundant life consist of? You may be wondering, well, you told me what the abundant life is, you defined it, but what does it consist of? And I'm not going to go through all of them, I'm just going to uh, quickly hit some of them. Um, the abundant life consists of redemption from sin. That pretty much means you are no longer a slave to sin, because when you commit sin, you are a slave to sin, John chapter 8, verse 34. But through Jesus' blood, we have redemption, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Then... Uh, the abundant life consists of remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. Um, let me elaborate a little bit on this one so you'll know what the abundant life is and when Jesus provides something that is more abundantly. Remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. Let's say you are 50 years old right now and you heard the gospel, you obey the gospel, and guess what happens? All those sins that you committed before you were 50 years old until the years when you were a rebellious teenager all those sins were forgiven. In fact, all the sins you may commit today, you know, because you are a new baby in Christ, all those sins are forgiven. All your future sins that you commit 10 years from now will be forgiven, provided that you walk in the light as he is in the light, and then we can have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all of your sins because we have an advocate with the Father, you know, in case we sin. There's you another benefit, an advocate, a lawyer in the heavenly courts, if you would, interceding for you so you can have unlimited forgiveness. But don't abuse that forgiveness. You know, it's unlimited in a sense, but don't abuse it like some people do. Well, you know, I'll commit the sin and I'll repent later. I'll commit another sin and I'll repent later. No, that's not the way it works. You know, you need to truly confess your sins, repent of your sins, and pray to God for forgiveness. And the forgiveness is made available to you abundantly, like the Bible says. Then we have reconciliation to God. Obviously, we're no longer enemies of God. I don't know about you, but, you know, I don't want to have God as my enemy. Hebrews 10, 31 clearly states, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And chapter 12, verse 29 clearly states, our God is a consuming fire. So you don't want to have God as an enemy. But in the abundant life Jesus gives you, you are no longer an enemy of God. You have been reconciled to God. Then adoption of sons, Ephesians 1, 5. 
In 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of life the, the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. You are sons and daughters of God, or the Most High God. And you've been adopted into the family of God. You know, we read stories or hear in the news uh, on TV, watch that, you know, some kids get adopted by celebrities. And a lot of people say, wow, that kid is lucky. He's going to get everything. You know, he, he's not going to struggle. You know, here I am trying to make ends meet, some parents say, to, to give everything to my kid. But, you know, he still doesn't have everything. But that kid, boy, he's lucky. He's going to have everything. Well, guess what? We have everything. And we have a promise of eternal life thanks to the sacrifice Jesus made. So we have adoptions as sons and inheritance. Yes, God is not so much interested in you living a rich life here, but he's interested in living a rich life, spiritually speaking. And then you have an inheritance reserved for you in heaven if you uh, remain faithful. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4, the inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled, and it doesn't fade away. So you may not enjoy riches here on earth, which is not the intention for us Christians to live everybody as rich, you know, or, or else everybody would be rich. But it is the intention of a Christian to be a sojourner in this world so we can enjoy our inheritance over there. An inheritance over here, you can spend it all, you know, like the prodigal son did. But the inheritance that we have as Christians pretty much is one that will last forever. Not only that, but we have the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, which is the assurance. You know, we've been sealed, and he is the assurance, the down payment that reassures you that you will get that inheritance in heaven. Not only that, but you have provision for all your needs. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and Philippians 4, 19. So the abundant light, as you can see, is, is abundantly full of blessings. And we need to appreciate those blessings found in Christ Jesus. But the abundant life requires certain things. I'm sure you know about it. It requires to live the change life. It requires to live the peaceful life. It requires you to live the fruitful life. And it requires you to live the prayerful life. So next, if there's anything I want you to take home tonight, that's it. I know you're probably not going to remember what I just said a few minutes ago or what I'm, what I'm going to say a few minutes later. But here it is. If you want to lead a prayerful life, you must make prayer a part of your everyday life. That's what I want you to take home. You know, I pay attention to the rest of what I'm going to say. You, know. uh, you spend some time preparing a lesson. That's what you expect from, from the brethren. But if this is what you're going to take home, that's, that's fine. If you want to lead a prayerful life, then you must make prayer a part of your everyday life. But how can you make prayer a part of your everyday life? Well, in order to make prayer a part of your everyday life, you must know what prayer is and how to pray. That is very important, especially for new converts. Sometimes, you know, well, I don't know how to pray. You know, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Nobody a, a ever taught me. So what you're going to get here is a micro crash course on prayer. What prayer is and how to pray. And what is prayer? Anyone, uh, anyone in knows? Uh, any, anybody wants to take a stab? No? Okay, that's fine. Let's go. <laughs> prayer, simply put, talking to God. That's it. Just talk to God. Talk to God, and that's it. You know, they just uh, uh, prayer is pretty much a conversation of the heart with God. You can put it like this. You know, it's a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God. Through prayer, we let God know the desires of our heart. And through prayer, we align ourselves with our Creator, and we get to improve our fellowship with Him. We get to cultivate our relationship with God through the avenue of prayer. So prayer is extremely important. And so what prayer is, is simply talking to God. It's not some sort of ritual where you have to light up candles, put a picture of, of God or Jesus, and start chanting and repeating long prayers, you know, with beats and everything. No, no. it's simple. Just talk to God. So how do you pray? Simply talk to God. I just said it. Talk to God. Just talk to him. You know, whatever's in your heart, let him know. He'll be listening to you. He'll be listening to you. Just talk to God. And there's an example there. Jesus' example. Right before he resurrected Lazarus, if you notice there, uh, you can read it later on, but if you notice, he told Martha, didn't I tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God. 
Then he asked the people to take away the stone. And, you know, before he called Lazarus and told him, Lazarus, come out, Jesus said a short prayer. He lifted his eyes and he said, Father, thank you because you have heard me. I know you always hear me, but because of some standing around here, I said it, that they may know that you have sent me. Short and sweet and simple. Does that sound complicated? Well, thank you, Father, because you have heard me. Apparently, Jesus had already asked for Lazarus' life to be given back to him. But he said, thank you, Father, because you have heard me. And I know you always hear me, but because of some standing around here, I said it, that they may know that you have sent me. Simple and sweet, short prayer. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get used to just offering God short prayers. You know, you need to offer God longer prayers also. Uh, John chapter 17, we can see there that Jesus uh, pretty much prayed a long prayer. He prayed for himself and uh, asked God, you know, uh, glorify me like I've glorified you, etc. Then he asked for his disciples, sanctify them in, in your word. Thy word is truth and, and be with them. Don't take them out of the world, you know, because they are in the world, but they're, they're not of the world, but, but we, be with them. And then he prayed. I also ask you, Father, for the members of the Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for future disciples, and we are those future disciples. Jesus prayed and made a long prayer, and so we need to learn to mix it up a little bit. Do short prayers and long prayers and take the time to do so. If you want to learn more about prayers and what to say to God and how to pray, then the model prayer is there for you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. I encourage you to study it at home, and you will be able to learn a lot from it. Also, the prayer of Ezra, Ezra chapter 9, verses 515, will, will teach you how to talk to God, you know, the heart-to-heart -heart conversation where you tell God pretty much, God, I'm ashamed of the things that I've done. Just like the children of Israel, you know, were ashamed. Ezra was ashamed because the people were marrying pagan women, and that was a big no-no for the children of Israel. And so what happened? Ezra says, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm, I'm so ashamed of, of what's going on, but it is what it is. Help us. You know, get back in track. And the people, fortunately, got back on track. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 11 also talks about, you know, the prayer that Nehemiah offered God. And it's simply talking to God. It's not complicated to, to talk to God. The apostles, Acts chapter 4, verse 24 through 31. And pretty much, just talk to God. If you got something in your heart, talk to God. You can pretty much, you know, talk to God anywhere. Let's just say for the sake of illustration that you went for a job interview and all of a sudden uh, you got the job right on the spot. Guess what happens? You go to your car and all of a sudden, oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. I got the job right on the spot. Thank you, Father. You know how much I needed that job. Thank you. Now just help me do a good job so I can keep my job. In Jesus' name, amen. Simple. You just talk to God wherever you are. Or... You can pray for somebody else. Well, let's not be selfish with our prayers. We can pray for other people too. We can find out like somebody had an accident and you can, oh, Father, I just found out so-and-so had an accident. He's headed to the surgery room. I don't know the details, but Father, please be with the doctors that will be performing the surgery and please be with his family in these tough times. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Simple, right? Is this micro crash course helpful? I hope it is. I hope it is, but talking to God is very simple. We need not to make it complicated. So it's very important that we do that, that we talk to God and offer our prayers in Jesus' name. So next, how do you make prayer a part of your everyday life? Number two, you must realize prayerlessness is a serious sin. Sometimes we get too comfortable with the short prayers here and there and just uh, scrambling, you know, to talk to God or just say, well, th thank you, Father, for this food I'm about to eat. And we eat. And we don't realize that our prayers, you know, are not getting past the ceiling, as we say in, I guess, every language in Spanish, I was going to say, but I heard it in English too. But seriously, prayerlessness is a serious sin. And for the sake of practicality and to include everybody, including myself, Prayerlessness is defined as not praying as often as you should or not praying at all. Have you ever met the kind of Christian that they don't pray outside these walls? They're just like, 
Okay, I know we heard a good prayer by the brother that led the prayer and he prayed for everybody and that's it. The rest of the week, they don't talk to their creator. They don't talk to God. So pretty much, it's a serious sin. Why? Because it's a sin against God. First Samuel 12, 23, Samuel put it this way, but far be it from me that I should sin against God by ceasing to pray for you. Stop right there. Zero in on the phrase. But far be it from me that I should sin against God by ceasing to pray for David and his family. By ceasing to pray for the evangelistic efforts of Palm Beach Lake Church of Christ. By ceasing to pray for new babies, uh, members of the family. By ceasing to pray, you name it. You sin against God when you don't pray. And that's why prayerlessness is a sin. And not only is it a sin because it's a sin against God, but it's a sin because it's a commandment to pray. Surprise, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. There it is. Pray without ceasing. Pray is in the imperative. And when ha what happens when you violate an imperative? You sin, you know, especially an imperative from the Bible. Uh, but it's in the imperative, and it gets magnified by without ceasing. Pray, an imperative, and do it without ceasing. Make a habit of prayer, a daily habit of prayer, and that way you will be able to keep in touch with your creator. But pray. Just because you are having tough times doesn't mean you get excused from praying. You need to pray. James 5.13, what does it say? It says pretty much, is anyone suffering? There's a commandment. Pray. We need to pray in every circumstance, and we need to pray every day. You go a day without praying, and you might think I'm being extremist here. You go a day without praying, you sin. You extend that to two days without praying, you're sinning two days. You extend that a week, a month, or months without praying, you are sinning against God. Because how many times does it take to break a command and then call it a sin? Once. If I curse once, then I'm guilty of getting cursed, you know, or, or cursing. If I get drunk once, I'm drink, I, I, I'm guilty of drinking once, and I have sinned. Same with prayer. You know, we, we sometimes just don't see it that way because we're so used to, well, you know, whenever I get the chance, I'll pray, and that's it. But we need to understand that prayerlessness is a sin, and we should pray at all times. Why? Because if we don't do so, then we just invite Satan into our lives. Matthew 26, 41. Jesus said there, pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if you know that the flesh is weak, then force your flesh to pray. The flesh will give you whatever excuse. Oh, don't do it, David. You've been working so hard with that sermon. You just need to clear your mind. Don't pray. Oh, well, you know, Brother Dirk, and don't pray. You've had a busy day at work, you know, and your job is not easy. It's heavy lifting and everything. Don't pray. Oh, well, Sister Carolina there, you know, that, that, that Netflix series, Stranger Things, is the last two episodes of season four. You got to watch it. I'll pray later. The flesh will give you whatever excuse to say, eh, I'm just too tired. I'm going to relax. I'm not going to pray. I'll pray tomorrow, right? What have you done? You are guilty of the sin of prayerlessness. Prayerlessness is a deliberate insult to God. It's like saying, God, <laughs> I wish I had time to pray to you right now. I, I just don't have time. But keep them blessings coming, right? I need blessings, Lord, but I don't have time to pray to you. You know, I don't have time to talk to you. So we need to understand, prayer is your lifeline. And if you sever that lifeline, you sever everything. You sever communication with the only being that can help you in all circumstances of your life. So it is important that we realize that if we want to make prayer a part of our everyday life, we must acknowledge and take it seriously that prayerlessness is a serious sin against God. Number three, you must practice the following suggestions if you want to make prayer a part of your everyday life. Number one, simple, right? Make time to pray. When it comes to prayer, it's not a matter of, well, I really don't have time. Nope. 
make time to pray. It doesn't matter if you're a busy soccer mom. I don't know who's a soccer mom here. Don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> doesn't matter if you have to take your kids to practice, to games, to celebrations because they won the game. Make time to pray. It doesn't matter if you are the most important CEO in a company and you have your agenda full of meetings and calls and this and that. Make time to pray. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher, because preachers are guilty of prayerlessness sometimes. They don't make time. If you've been working on that lesson and you say, oh, no, I got two more lessons to prepare, make time to pray. A lot of preachers, they're guilty. You know, in preaching school, they tell you, before you start your sermon preparation, always start with a prayer. A lot of them don't do that. They just, oh, I got an idea. Psst, let's just jump right in. Everybody is guilty of not praying and not making time to pray. Jesus made time to pray. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 tells us that Jesus got up early in the morning while it was still dark, and he went to a solitary place to pray. If you read the previous verses, you'll know that he had a very busy day. Jesus was there, you know, preaching the word all day, perhaps traveling a little bit. And in the evening, they started bringing him more people to heal, uh, more people to cast out demons uh, away from them, uh, more people to just hear the word. And he was very busy, and they probably kept him up, you know, for the later part of the night. But the next day, he got up early and went to a separate place to pray. He made time. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 16 tells us that he often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. And not only that, but Matthew chapter 14, verse 23 tells us that he always ended his day with a prayer. So Jesus started his day with a prayer, and he ended his day with a prayer, and he prayed in between throughout the day. So it's important. God would be lucky if he gets 30 seconds of prayer from some Christians. That's why I'm all in favor to change in the lyrics and the title of the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, to Sweet Minute of Prayer. And I think I'm being generous, unfortunately. Let me show you what I mean. All right. Sample prayers. Sometimes we repeat the same prayers. There's nothing wrong with it. But notice, thank you, Father, for this food we're about to eat. May it be of good nourishment to our bodies. And may we use the strength that we gain from it for service in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 11 seconds. Here we go. Let's do the classic for kids. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Nine seconds. Are you going to tell me that we as mature Christians are going to be offering to God, kids' prayers? We should be more mature than that and make time. And you don't have to make extra time. Now i got to watch four hours of TV, and now i got to add an extra hour just to pray. No. Cut it down to three and dedicate one hour to prayer to God. You don't have to make extra time. You just have to substitute sometimes. Instead of watching three episodes in Netflix, watch two or one and dedicate time to study uh, God's word and to pray. So when it comes to prayer, we all can make time. And one of the practical suggestions, I know you need to find the quietest place, but sometimes when you're driving, you can still pray. And you don't have to worry about people thinking you're crazy because everybody has Bluetooth today. And so if you, you're talking to God, people are going to say, oh, no, he's in a phone call. She's in a phone call. So you don't have to worry. But the point is, make time to pray. Second suggestion You read it, but I, I don't know if, if you know what that is. You know, it's been so long since the church has knelt. Or one knee, two knees, one knee. Kneel to pray. Kneel to pray. It's important that we kneel to pray every now and then. As Brother Wayne Jackson in some of his articles, especially the one with lifting up hands, he said there's nothing wrong with this. Obviously, we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit uh, later on. But he says there's nothing wrong with that. It's not binding, not forbidden. It's a matter of judgment. But the problem is that sometimes in the church, we have become so paranoid. 
oh, he, he knelt down to pray. I don't think we're going to invite him to speak anymore because, you know, he's probably going back to Pentecostal. I used to be at Pentecostal, for those who don't know. Oh, oh he's, he's turning Pentecostal. He's turning liberal. He's part of the change agent movement trying to do, introduce change in the church. Is kneeling down to pray a change or is it in the Bible already? It's in the Bible already. Sometimes we get too paranoid and, and sometimes we argue, well, brother, um, posture is not really important. What matters is the heart. And yeah, I agree. If your heart is not right with God, kneeling won't do you any good. But on the other hand, if your heart is right with God and it compels you to kneel, do it. We don't see it in the church as often, but at least try it at home. At least do it at home. Because aren't we the ones that supposedly promote do things the Bible way and call things by Bible names? Aren't we the ones promoting that? But we worry too much about what people are going to say about us. We worry too much, oh, I don't want them to think I'm changing doctrinally. I don't want them to think that I'm a liberal. People already criticize us as it is. We think we're boring because we don't use instrumental music and we don't have a choir here. Do we care about that? Do we start changing because of that? No, we keep doing the same biblical thing. They already criticize us because we believe that we are baptizing water for the remission of our sins. But do we start getting wishy-washy because people criticize us? No, we keep doing the same biblical thing. So why do we apply the Bible and call it by Bible names on certain things, but on other things we don't? So it's important we understand that kneeling is a biblical posture. Don't panic. Uh, if you notice, it's like kneeling. Out of all the postures, uh, praying postures in the Bible, kneeling is probably the one that kind of carried over from the Old Testament into the New Testament, and it gets highlighted a lot. Jesus, Luke 22, verse 41, before he was betrayed, he knelt down to pray. Stephen, Acts 7, 60, he knelt down to pray. Peter, Acts chapter 9, verse 40, he knelt down to pray. Paul, Acts chapter 20, verse 36, knelt down with the efficient elders. That means the elders also knelt down to pray. Paul again, chapter 21, verse 5, he met some disciples in the city of Tyre. And then those disciples, I don't know how many they were, but the men took their, their wives and their children. And they went to the beach to say goodbye to Paul because he was living on a ship. And while they were on the beach, they knelt down to pray. What a powerful display of a devoted Christian. And here we are worrying about what people are going to think about us. I don't know if they wear shorts or pants, but in the beach, you know, there's always sand, right? So why could they do it and we have stopped doing it? Again, I'm not saying it's imposed on you, but it's something optional that you can do it. You know, it's, it's, it's something that it's biblical. It's something that throughout history, we even brag about James, the half-brother of Jesus. You know, he had knees like that of a camel because he spent so much time kneeling down. If you want to read the story, Google old camel knees. And the first name that is going to pop there is James, the brother of Jesus, or half-brother of Jesus, however you want to say it. But old camel knees. And concerning the lifting hands, obviously, I think we've misunderstood Brother Dave Miller and Brother Wayne Jackson. I remember clearly when Brother Dave Miller was teaching about lifting up holy hands, he was not condemning this posture. He was condemning this. Or this. Or this. And I clearly remember the example he gave us. If a baby comes to you like a toddler and he's like, Mommy, Daddy, he wants arms, right? You pick him up. And his example was so clear that I was like, oh, okay, it does make sense. But what if that toddler came to you, mommy? Right? So he's not even condemning this. Thank you, Father, for this day. Whatever your prayer is going to be. But he's condemning all these changes and, and emotions that, that the change agent movement is trying to promote. But it's important that we understand no, kneeling is an option when you pray. And even this, if you want to do it at home or even in the church. But, but then again, we, we go through to, to the same thing. 
Uh, in the two articles, they're virtually identical. One of them is a little bit longer than the other. Uh, Brother Wayne Jackson had on lifting up holy hands. He was saying, you know, it's optional. It's a matter of judgment. But then he says, if I give you my opinion, it's just my personal opinion, he says in the article, uh, the only thing you got to watch out if they're going to start questioning your how you stand doctrinally. There we go again. We're worrying too much about what people are going to say about us. But we need to learn to kneel to pray. All right. We got five minutes. Next suggestion. Make a prayer list. It's going to be quick. Oops, sorry. They're so sensitive, these remotes. Make a prayer list. Unless you have a photographic memory, you're not going to remember everyone and everything you need to pray for. So make a prayer list. Imagine if the one who led the prayer for all the requests that were placed tonight, he just said, no, I'm going to rely on my memory. He gets up here and all of a sudden, we prayed for, to you for brother, what was his name, what was his name? And he doesn't remember. Make a prayer list. A prayer list is so helpful when it comes to praying. And no one ever said you always have to have your eyes closed. You need to have your prayer list there. And you're praying to God. Okay, and then the next one. Okay, here it is. I'm going to pray for everybody. All those listed there. And also, a prayer list helps you highlight and spot all the things that you need help with. My jealous wife. My jealous husband. I can stand other people talking to my wife or to my husband. Well, pray. There you have. I have problems with jealousy. I get so angry at my brother in Christ. I don't want to take it from them. But I take it from everybody at work. And I don't say anything. Well, there's another list. I have problems with anger. Lord, please help me with my anger. I don't have patience with my wife. Honey, can I tell you? No, 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 no. Go away. But if somebody else comes, oh, yeah, come on. See, see, let me show you. Well, it's another thing. I don't have patience with my wife. Lord, please help me. But you cannot do that if you don't have a prayer list because you're going to forget. And then you forget so much that you don't realize you have a problem with certain issues in your life, certain attitudes in your life. So make a prayer list. Um, and then we're almost done. We've got five minutes. I want to run through this quick because they're common sense. Find someone to pray with. Pray with your spouse. When was the last time you prayed with your wife? Answer that to yourself. Do you even pray with your wife? As leaders of the home, we are supposed to help our wives, and they are supposed to help us go to heaven, right? But if you're not praying at home with your wife, and you just pray at church, then what are you doing? You know, what are you doing exactly? Pray with your children. Do you even pray with your children? Or are you the type of parent that says, ah, no, I'm not going to force that into my kids. It's got to come out from the heart. Well, guess what? They're living under your roof. You're paying their bills. You're feeding them. They're supposed to do whatever you tell them. Children, obey your parents in everything, right? Colossians chapter, what's the passage? 4, verse 2, somewhere over there. They're supposed to obey you. I remember when my dad first got converted, we spent like a long time having devotionals. At first, as teenagers, oh, dad, come on, we just went to church yesterday. Oh, come on, Dad, we're going to church tomorrow. It feels weird singing here and then praying. But as time went by, we got used to it. At some point, we stopped. But the experience there, it was very encouraging because it's something you have to get used to. Remember, force your flesh to pray and to do other spiritual disciplines. Make a prayer list. Pray with your elders. I was reading a bulletin about a month ago, and the elders were going to meet in Adult 3, I believe, and they were going to pray. And they invited some people. And I asked one of the elders for the sake of illustration. You know, I'm looking for illustrations. How many people showed up? And he said, well, you know, at one point, uh, I think 15 other people showed up. Whoever you are, kudos to you. Kudos is the word, right? Great job. How many members are here? 400? Where are the other 385 members? Pray with your elders. Pray for your elders. 
I'm sure if that little room, adult three, gets full, they're not going to mind moving into the family room to have more people in. But pray with your elders because, and with your elders because they are the ones supervising your soul. So it's important that you make a prayer list and find someone to pray with. Number five, pray over scriptures. I'm not going to get into detail with that, but here's an example on how you can pray over scriptures based on, um, <coughs> on uh, Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. Uh, you know what it says, uh, read it at home, but here's the prayer. Dear Father, at this time I ask you that you please help me trust in you more. I know that sometimes I don't trust in you the way I should, but I ask that you help me overcome my doubts and rely solely on your will. Help me acknowledge you in everything I do. Help me not be wise in my own understanding. Please, Father, make my path straight and help me turn away from evil. In Jesus' name, I pray. Praying over scriptures will enhance your prayer life and it will help you not run out of things to say. But unfortunately, we have run out of time. The other one is very simple. You've seen it before. Those acronyms, you know, acts, adoration, confession, uh, thanksgiving, supplication. Read the little book. I don't know what it's called. My wife has it. Uh, Sister Connie uh, gave it to her. But pretty much read that book. You know, and it, it will take you through prayer and help you improve it. Because we always, we always need to praise God when we pray. We always need to confess our sins. Don't be that, that rebellious kid that, you know, insulted his father and then all of a sudden, oh, dad, I need money. Don't insult God. Don't sin against God. And then, oh, God, I need this. Quick. Always confess your sins. Always thank God for everything he does for you. And always ask for your needs and the needs of others. So in conclusion, if you want to lead a prayerful life, then make prayer a part of your everyday life. Let us bow.